I am a capitalist, and after a 30-year career in capitalism, spanning three dozen companies, generating tens of billions of dollars in market value, I'm not just in the top one percent; I'm in the top 0.01 percent of all earners. Today, I have come to share the secrets of our success because rich capitalists like me have never been richer. So the question is, how do we do it? The words of Nick Hanauer, a super wealthy American entrepreneur who argues that modern capitalist economies need a major rethink. Welcome to a new season of the LSEIQ podcast, where we ask social scientists and other experts to answer one intelligent question. I'm Joanna Bale from the IQ team. We work with academics to tell you about their latest research and ideas. This month, we're asking, what's the future of capitalism? We're going to meet a pair of young academics whose recent research on the economic effects of tax cuts for the rich went viral on social media and received record numbers of downloads. You'll also be hearing why the greatest social levelling experiment of the 20th century, the Russian Revolution, failed to erase the middle classes despite brutal repression. But first, we're going to challenge a best-selling, prize-winning author who grew up under communism but now lives in the UK to tell us which political system is better. Albania in the 80s was a very isolated country. It was very cut off, not just politically, but also economically. And so financially, the situation was very bad and there was lots of scarcity, there were lots of queues. This is Lea Upi, professor in political theory at LSE, who grew up in communist Albania in the 1980s. School was very politicized and we were told to love the party and Enver Hoxha, who was the leader of the Albanian Communist Party, who died when I was about five and a half. In fact, that's one of my first political memories. So it was a combination of heavy political indoctrination with economic scarcity, with the rhetoric of an isolated country that promised to be one of the few remaining really communist countries in the world. Leia's new book, Free, is a thought-provoking memoir of how her world transformed with Albania's rapid transition from totalitarian communism to liberal capitalism. She explores how each system promises but fails to give people different forms of freedom and how we can learn from both. In the book, you talk about your childhood as really believing in the whole ethos behind that political system. When I was at nursery, Enver Hoxha, a communist leader, died and we were told that this was a great loss for the country. And I believed in everything I was told in school, but also at home, no one did anything to try and undermine that narrative. So my parents sustained the stories that I brought home from nursery and school afterwards. And so I believed that I was a good pioneer. I was fighting for the communist cause and I was aware that Albania had to make sacrifices and that we were isolated, that we couldn't travel, for example. But I thought all of these sacrifices were necessary in the name of these greater ideals that the country pursued. But there was a little glimpse of what of some kind of envy of of Western capitalism. There's a little um, anecdote you tell about a Coke can. Because we were so isolated and because people couldn't travel, there was a real fetishization of what was going on outside Albania and especially in the capitalist world. Coca-Cola was something that didn't exist. We didn't have it was just not imported, it just didn't exist, but it was considered one of these rare goods that stood as a symbol of some encounter with the West. And so in my book, I tell the story of when my mother and a neighbor had bought simultaneously a used Coca-Cola can, um, each of them separately, and then one of the cans disappeared from the bookshelf. So people would expose these cans, everybody, or not everybody, but the, those who could have, or those who were in possession of a can would put it in pride of place in their living room to show that they had had this somehow symbolic encounter with the West. And so I tell the story of when they had this fight because one of the cans disappeared and uh, my mother was accusing the neighbor of taking her can. And so um, every Albanian family has a story about a Coca-Cola can. And uh, they really, we only really saw them for the first time and we saw the function and we knew that they were to carry these drinks that we'd never had in Albania after 1990 when the system changed. So what actually happened in the 90s? I mean, obviously, um, it, it all kind of um, ended very suddenly, didn't it? 
statues were toppled and all that kind of thing. Yeah, in 1990, um, there was a wind of change across Eastern Europe. Obviously, the Berlin Wall had fallen in 1989. And uh, for a while, Albania was untouched by these events, in part because it didn't belong to the Soviet bloc of countries. And so the rhetoric inside the country was that these were changes that only affected other parts of Europe, other parts of Eastern Europe. And in some ways, the discourse was also that they were meeting the fate that they had always deserved because they were always so moderate. And uh, But then there were things changed in Romania as well, and that touched more Albania because the history of Al- Albanian communism was somewhat perceived by citizens as more in parallel with uh, Romanian communism. Leia is referring here to the overthrow and execution of Nicolae Ceausescu, the president of Romania, during the anti-communist uprising in December 1989. There was this cult of the individual and the cult of Ceausescu was somewhat similar to what in Albania we had with Enver Hoxha. And so there became a wave of protests at university, which started at the beginning as a wave of protests for economic conditions, but very quickly turned into something much more radical and demanding fundamental political change. And to in some ways to the surprise of citizens, the government caved in very quickly. And so it wasn't... Um, as violent or as repressive as one might have expected given the nature of Albanian communism up to that point. Everything changed overnight. We had political pluralism and and then this was followed by an opening of borders and so all Albanians who had been isolated for 15 years couldn't travel were now allowed to travel. So in 1991, the first democratic elections took place since the communists had taken power almost 50 years earlier. The communists managed to retain control of the government in the first round of elections, but fell two months later during a general strike. In her book, Leia describes the chaos that ensued as Albania embraced unbridled capitalism, leaving it on the brink of civil war. Privatisation meant that many people lost their jobs. Others lost all their savings in unregulated investment schemes. So hundreds of thousands were forced to leave for a new life in the West. Leia also discovered that her parents had been leading a double life. You discovered that your your family were were actually dissidents, didn't you? That, that, That they kept all that from you when you were a child and that both your grandfathers had been political prisoners and conversations about people going to university were actually secret code for going to prison or even being executed. How did you feel when you discovered all of that? So um, it was it was very strange and very confusing for me because because my parents had never done anything to undermine the narrative that I was given at school it, to be told overnight that this is not what reality is and what you believed up to that point is very different is very was very hard to take and very hard to absorb quickly. You don't know who to trust and you don't know if you can ever trust anyone again. So I feel like the, the consequences of that has have stayed with me in terms of making me really um, concerned and c- keen to discover what really truth is behind the surfaces and behind the appearances and also behind the way in which messages are often ideologically driven and packaged. This led Leia to reflect on the different freedoms she experienced under communism and capitalism in her book. What was happening in the communist period was that there was a sense in which in scarcity uh, one had to, uh, but in the presence of a discourse of solidarity that was in one way or another imposed by the state, people found ways of sharing and tried to find ways of uh, overcoming the hardships of daily life through this, through coming together. And so they built very strong networks, very strong contacts with neighbors or with family. In the post-communist period, if you went through these kinds of hardships, if you were unable to make a living, it was because you had failed, because you were unable to find. And so there was a kind of stigma around joblessness, around uh, asking for help, and help could only come in the form of uh, charity rather than mutual collective support. You explore the, yeah, those differences in freedom between communism and, and capitalism. Which one do you think gets closer to freedom for most people? I, I'm always reluctant to compare one to the other and because I think they're actually really hard to compare. There are such different metrics and so you're not really comparing like for like. 
to me it looks like each of them has their forms of unfreedom and each of them has a set of ideals that it promises and each of them has a set of historical and political failures that it needs to take responsibility for. And so I'm more interested in the kind of cracks in the system and in trying to see and to talk about how these systems that promise us freedom actually fail to realize uh, that and to think about the history of these attempts to realize freedom as something that we can learn from when we take forward this uh, search for freedom. Hi, I'm interrupting this episode of LSE IQ to let you know where you can find even more amazing LSE content. Our public lectures are free to attend and feature some of the most influential figures in the social sciences. To listen to past events, search LSE Lectures and Events wherever you get your podcasts and visit lse.ac.uk forward slash events to check out our upcoming programme. Now, back to IQ. So Leia Upi explores how both communism and capitalism promise but fail to give people different forms of freedom and what we can learn from both and how, in both systems, messages are often ideologically driven and packaged but she is reluctant to be drawn on which system works better for most people. You are listening to the LSE IQ podcast with me, Joanna Bale. This month, we're asking, what's the future of capitalism? The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. Greed for life, for money, for love, knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. And greed, you mark my words, will not only save Teldar paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. Thank you very much. The iconic Greed is Good speech from the 1987 movie Wall Street came to epitomise the new individualism and excesses of the 1980s. Michael Douglas plays Gordon Gecko, the unscrupulous corporate raider who will stop at nothing to increase his vast wealth. The decade saw Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan being elected on promises of major tax cuts for the rich. They formed a close personal and ideological bond. We in Britain think you are a wonderful president. We share so many of the same goals and a determination to achieve them, which you summed up so well, and alas, I cannot in- imitate this wonderful American English accent. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Nearly four decades later, President Trump sold his tax cuts as rocket fuel for the economy arguing that freeing up money for the wealthy would allow them to hire more workers, pay better wages and invest more. Just three months ago, we came to this state to launch our plan to bring back Main Street by cutting taxes for American families and small businesses. Today, I've come back to this incredible state to spend an afternoon with its amazing citizens. You are amazing to help push our plan for historic tax cuts right across that finish line. We're going to do that. If we do this, then America will win again like never, ever before. So it's a political idea that has persisted, that letting rich people keep more of their money in tax cuts means they will effectively share it out that it will trickle down to the lowest income earners. But it's an idea that has been comprehensively debunked by our next guests, David Hope and Julian Lindbergh of LSE's International Inequalities Institute and King's College London. They analyse the economic effects of tax cuts introduced by politicians like Thatcher, Reagan and Trump across five decades and 18 wealthy nations. Their conclusion? The rich got richer and there was no meaningful effect on unemployment or economic growth. It really struck a nerve. It was, I would say, not the typical response we get when we publish an academic paper. 
So that paper uh, has been downloaded about 150,000 times, uh, which to put that in some context, my previous working paper in that series was downloaded, I think a staggering 200 times. Uh, and so this was really uh, quite different from the norm in that respect. This is David Hope. When I worked with him and Julian Lindbergh back in 2020 to publicise their research, we never imagined what would happen next. It attracted extensive global media coverage, went viral on social media, and was cited by high-profile economists and politicians. As a result, it became the most downloaded paper in the 18-year history of LSE Research Online, the database of all research produced by LSE academics. You know, for someone who's never had a Twitter account, to go viral on Twitter was quite a, an experience. Uh, and we had uh, many of our colleagues sort of sending us memes about the paper uh, during the days after its release. Uh, and we took it upon ourselves to put those at the start of a number of academic presentations we did on the paper after that, because, you know, you don't get this opportunity uh, too often. Uh, I mean, you were on Twitter at the time, Julian. What did you think of the kind of reaction that we got? Yes, although I have to admit, very irregularly and uh, <laughs> I forgot my passport every now and then. But yeah, it was actually quite interesting because we got more or less two types of reaction uh, reactions. And one was actually reactions that said this cannot be true and um, we don't believe this. And also you are socialists <laughs> and, and that's it. That was one kind of reactions. And the other type of reaction was basically, well, I knew all of this already. Thank you, Captain Obvious. So there was little ground in between between these two extremes, which we found quite surprising, actually. And it actually, um, I mean, strengthened our belief that like a data driven approach, look at these questions going a bit beyond this political polarization is is needed and actually the uh, substantial need for such for such research who was interacting or reacting on twitter can you remember who well so generally like from the broad public it was there was particularly interest in the us i would say so in the broad public we also got quite some um quite some high profile politicians uh, tweeting about it so elizabeth warren had a tweet about it um, which was also sent to us because not that <laughs> usual uh, Twitter users that some friends of mine send it to us. But yeah, that that was also the case. But particularly in the US, I would say there was. Um, why do you think it? Why, why do you think it captured the imagination? And why do you think it, particularly in the US? Clearly, and I think we were a bit naive, maybe in not thinking about this beforehand. It's clearly a very partisan and polarized and politically contentious issue, particularly in the US. In part because you know as they've uh, revolved through Democrat and Republican. Um, administrations, there have been major changes in taxes on the rich. So we've seen big tax cuts under George W. Bush. We've seen big tax cuts under Donald Trump. Uh, and so I think it really plays into the political dynamic in that country. Uh, and that was why people were very engaged with it. I asked David to explain why cutting taxes for the rich did nothing to boost economies. He refers to Thomas Piketty, the economist who argues that unless capitalism is reformed, it will threaten the democratic order. But our results align pretty closely with some work from Thomas Piketty uh, that would suggest that what happens if you cut taxes on the rich is that they then bargain more aggressively for their own compensation at the direct expense of workers lower down the income distribution. So the story of the paper then is really to do with rent seeking among CEOs and top executives uh, and that increasing when you have lower taxes on the rich. David refers here to rent seeking which is the effort to increase one's share of existing wealth without creating new wealth, rather like a greedy child demanding a bigger slice of the pie so that there's less on the plate for everyone else. So thinking about the policy implications of the paper, I think there's one major and fairly obvious policy implication, which is not to cut taxes on the rich to boost the economy, and particularly if you care about inequality. And I think it's particularly important to make this argument because proponents of cutting taxes on the rich um, often make this type of argument about the economic benefits. So in 2017, when Donald Trump was introducing the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, he claimed to the American people that this would be rocket fuel uh, for the US economy. And we don't find any evidence in our study across 18 advanced economies of 50 years of that kind of effect uh, being uh, true. David and Julian are now following up this research by investigating why ordinary people support tax cuts for the rich. The average citizen seems to be fairly poorly informed that taxes on the rich have fallen really dramatically in the past 40 years. If you give them that information, it makes them uh, less likely to support tax cuts for the rich. Uh, and these effects we found are particularly strong for Republican voters. And why do you think people are so poorly informed about this? 
Well, that, that's a good question, actually. I mean, it's it's hard. We haven't we haven't particularly looked into why that might be the case. I think it probably has something to do um, with the importance of studying economic history, probably like basic economic history uh, um, education that people get. And I mean, normally, particularly these kinds of topics. And that speaking from speaking as a person who's done tax policy research, uh, most most of his uh, academic life, the first reaction you kind of get from people is that they're uninterested, mm. <laughs> especially in <laughs> it's too technical <laughs> and all of these things. So that might also play into there. So so maybe like economic history, studying economic history, um, um, economics, but over a long term, over a longer run. And, and making it a bit more interesting and showing that this is actually, you know, central questions about inequality that come along with it, central questions about who gets what, um, that taxation is at the core of it might make a difference there. I think also, you know, on a more practical sense, maybe uh, the media uh, have some role in, in sort of uh, this not being uh, so well communicated. And, and it seems like maybe politicians on the left are not getting this message across. Our work would suggest that... Um, having a more progressive system of wealth and income taxation would be one way uh, in which you could reduce inequalities between uh, members of society. So David Hope and Julian Lindbergh say their research shows that cutting taxes for the rich has no effect on economic growth or unemployment. It simply makes rich people richer, increasing income inequality in modern capitalist economies. And it's a political idea that is deeply ingrained so the situation could continue to escalate. Economists and political scientists have long focused on how rising wealth inequality creates divided societies. But what else might be contributing? Let's return to how people behave under communist regimes. This time Bolshevik Russia, following the Russian Revolution of 1917, one of the most extraordinary social levelling experiments of the 20th century. Tamila Lankina is Professor of International Relations at LSE. In her new book, The Estate Origins of Democracy in Russia, From Imperial Bourgeoisie to Post-Communist Middle Class, she reveals how the Russian middle classes survived despite brutal repression under Stalin. In doing so, she challenges the idea that inequality is just driven by wealth, instead highlighting the significance of social, cultural and educational factors. Her book focuses on a recently discovered archive of letters and documents from a large merchant family. The reason why this archive was preserved is because the one of the members of the family, Constantine Nekluten, emigrated to America, took his immediate uh, family with him, but a large chunk of his relatives, of over 30 people, stayed in Russia. And they were writing letters to him and his wife, and in turn, Constantine was sending packages and money transfers to, to this family, and he preserved records uh, very meticulously. And what we learned from this archive is the process of adaptation of merchant families who might have lost all their wealth, but they haven't lost the values and the human capital. And my book is very much a story about the kind of in the the non tangible aspect of inequalities that like human capital endowments that cannot be simply taken away in the same way that material wealth could be redistributed. Tamila talks about human capital a concept used by social scientists to designate personal attributes that help individuals or groups to realise their potential and become productive members of society. It includes knowledge, skills, experience, intelligence, training and judgement. They were absolutely obsessed with obtaining education for themselves, for their children. Even in Bolshevik Russia, they clung on to these lives from the past and very much these lives revolved around education, education, education. That was very much part of their, who they were in terms of their social identities, sense of belonging and social status. What we find is that some of these people lost absolutely everything. Their relatives were repressed. Many aristocrats emigrated, some of their relatives stayed, many were shot, incarcerated in the gulag, but they all banded together, they helped each other, they preserved their social networks, and they helped provide the same kind of education that they uh, 
uh, thought they, they, they merited in the czarist period. They often had homeschooling groups. They taught their children in the home or they aspired for very good schools. And many of them actually kept these schools from the czarist past alive well into the 1920s. Many of these schools simply changed their names in Soviet Russia, but they often retained the same teachers. So we find a direct extension of the kind of human capital and aspirations that I link in my book to these so-called educated estates of aristocracy, merchants, the urban groups, uh, group of Mishani and clergy, of course. What does this mean for how we tackle inequality now? So this means, unfortunately, a message that is not always very easy to sort of digest or accept uh, to policymakers because it tells us that simple redistributive solutions to inequality in a kind of material sense don't work uh, very well in the long term. So we find, for instance, that um, Russia might have leveled up leveled out incomes, uh, Bolshevik Russia, uh, communist Russia in in the 20th century. But in the kind of subsequent generations, um, the inequalities reappear because either in the material sense or simply in the sense of human capital. So Tamila is saying that human capital, the knowledge and skills that people accumulate, cannot be so easily redistributed as material wealth. Of course, in Soviet in the Soviet Union, incomes were not as they were not such a big. There was not such a big income inequality like we find now in modern capitalist societies. So, but in a kind of non-material sense, in terms of status, education, and prestige of professions, very much we find the reproduction of inequalities. Um, if not in the same, then in the next uh, generations. And so the message for policymakers is that one has to focus on these kind of non-material aspects of levelling society. So we've heard from Leia Upi, who draws from her personal experience of life under communism to explore how both communism and capitalism promise but fail to give people different forms of freedom and how in both systems messages are often ideologically driven and packaged. Messages like trickle-down economics, an idea that has been debunked by David Hope and Julian Lindbergh, who found that tax cuts for the rich, introduced by politicians including Thatcher, Reagan and Trump, across five decades and 18 wealthy nations, simply made the rich richer. Then we heard from Tamila Lankina, who analysed why the greatest social levelling experiment of the 20th century, the Russian Revolution, failed to erase the middle classes, despite brutal repression. She believes that addressing inequality isn't just about wealth and income, but also about overcoming hidden barriers, such as access to high-quality education. Finally, I asked Leia Upi if she believes that capitalism will continue to dominate in the long term. No, I don't think it will. I mean, no no system, if you think about the history of humanity and from its beginnings to now, the world has gone through different political regimes and um, different understandings of what, what democracy is and what brings freedom and how should political um, institutions relate to each other. So I don't think capitalism is eternal. I also think there are important contradictions that we are all aware of and perhaps we haven't articulated sufficiently the response to those contradictions and perhaps we lack emancipatory discourses that can take citizens forward in terms of carrying them to the next stage. But um, we do face very significant crises. I mean, the environmental uh, breakdown is just one example of the inability of the system that we have, of the values that are at the center of that system, to cope with the scale of the crisis that await for us. And so to me, it seems uh, necessary to think about alternatives to that system. People say capitalism has lifted lots of people out of poverty, but also inequality appears to be getting worse, doesn't it? But I always like to talk about freedom rather than equality. I think it's really important to understand that what is at stake in inequality is a kind of unequal freedom. And it's really important to emphasize that because capitalism and liberalism 
pride themselves on promoting freedom. And for me, the most important critique of capitalism is not one that says capitalism is unequal, is one that says this is a system that has promised to bring freedom to everyone in the world. But in fact, in bringing inequality has also made it impossible for some people to be as free as others. And if you live in a world in which only some people are free and others aren't, then how can you call that a free world? And how can you think that the system that dominates that world is a a system for the free? This episode was produced by me, Joanna Bale, with script supervision from Sophie Mallett and editing by Mike Wilkerson. If you'd like to find out more about the research in this episode, please head to the show notes. And if you enjoy LSEIQ, please leave us a review. Coming soon on LSEIQ. I went back to the same spot 15 years later. The great cliffs of ice had vanished. There was a lot of bare rock. The ice that remained was sort of battered and darkened and diminished. And the rate of melting had just gone off the scale. And the scientist I was with said he couldn't sleep at night for thinking how much ice was melting into the oceans and raising sea levels and threatening particularly poor coastal communities in Asia and Africa. And it was like stepping into a scene from the apocalypse. Anna Bevan asked the BBC's former science editor and now visiting professor in practice at LSE, David Shookman, how can we survive the next mass extinction? 